Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 2020 version of Urban Festival. This is Urban Fest 2020, and what an exciting month ahead you and I will have over the next 31 days, where we will collect our ideas, our imaginations, and collect our efforts towards shaping what we think and what we hope and what we imagine to be the empowerment of the civic. That is the theme of this year's uh, festival, empowering the civic. And no better way to kick off the first session of this festival this month than to have a fantastic address by the Deputy Minister of Cooperative Governance, uh, Deputy Minister Pax Tau, who will be addressing us very shortly followed by a very important and robust conversation uh, right after that. And you will have opportunities to ask the minister questions. Should you have any questions and you're a part of the chat and you're a part of the live stream, that is, you can drop us a question in the chat box and we will be able to view your questions, pose it to the deputy minister, and hopefully we can have a couple of those questions answered. If you're on social media, do tweet us. It is at SA Cities Network. That is at SA Cities Network. Or you can simply use the hashtag, hashtag UrbanFest2020. You can do that across Twitter, Instagram, as well as Facebook. With that hashtag, we'll be able to find your comments and your questions. We look forward to engaging you not just today, but over the next 31 days as we empower the civic, as we listen to various creatives, thinkers, and leaders engage on what it means to empower the civic and what it means to uh, reimagine or use our collective imagination uh, to really build the types of cities and urban spaces uh, that are inclusive, growth oriented, and that are built for you and I, not just today, but well into the future. Welcome to the program. And without any further ado, I'm going to introduce the, minister, the Deputy Minister of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs, Deputy Minister Pax Tau, who was born in Soweto. He served as the mayor of Johannesburg and served on various prestigious and important organizations. He, was, he served also as the chairperson uh, of SALGA, the South African uh, Local Government Association. Um, he also serves as the president of the United Cities and Local Government. Um, and moved from uh, the city of Johannesburg where he served as the mayor and now serves as the deputy minister uh, in, in the portfolio of cooperative governance and traditional affairs. Deputy Minister, good morning. Thank you so much for your time. Really do appreciate it and welcome to Urban Fest 2020. Good morning and thank you very much, Oliver. Let me uh, take this opportunity to greet all the participants this morning and every, everybody that has taken the time to to um, link into the platform this morning. I think it is a particularly important occasion as we launch the Urban Festival, which is an opportunity for us to discuss the issues that we confront, confront from uh, the point of view of our cities uh, and urbanization uh, in our country and indeed internationally. Let me also acknowledge at this point all the partners that have come together to organize this festival. There's a range of partners as would be demonstrated uh, over the next month uh, as they participate at different levels of uh, the urban festival. Now, South Africa adopted its own urban policy in 2016 titled the Integrated Urban Development Framework. This in response to um, the United Nations call for countries to adopt in line with the new urban agenda and urban policy. Uh, but in our context, it is particularly important that we adopted an urban policy because like many of our counterparts in the global South and in Africa in particular, South Africa is experiencing high levels of urbanization um, and cities are continuing to play an important role in the way in which our country develops and our society is able to develop. We continuously seeing large numbers of people moving into cities and urban centers in search of opportunity and the ability to uh, upgrade themselves, to prosper and respond in, in, in the cities that they locate. But in many ways, they also contribute uh, to the growth and prosperity of not just the cities, but the countries as a whole, the country as a whole. So our urban policy was in response to the, to the new urban agenda, but also in response to our own challenges. And let me talk about what 
are our challenge, our challenges as South African cities. The first and most obvious is the reality of a spatial legacy of apartheid that locates poor black people in the periphery of cities. It is monofunctional cities or monofunctional settlements where you have residential settlements separate from uh, the rest of the urban amenity, commercial, industrial, uh, institutional, and other opportunities that cities provide. Uh, and this creates a whole range of challenges that cities need to deal with, um, including, but not limited to, the reality that uh, our transport system is, is uh, essentially affected by the reality that you have to move masses of people through mass transit systems in a one directional way uh, where people need to get to their jobs and other opportunities. Um, pretty much in the morning, you track masses of people from townships into cities and then in the evening you track them back. Now transport systems uh, that are designed like that are not the most efficient because in essence, you're supposed to have a transport system that is circular where at all times the bus is able to or the train is able to uh, move people throughout the city so that you, you're able to gain efficiencies. Now I'm using transport as one example. You can use water, electricity, roads, the inefficiency of the urban system uh, that we've inherited is part of the challenges that we have. But also our cities do not just have challenges, they are centers of opportunity. You have cities that play an important economic role, they play an important role in terms of research and institutional development, they play an important role in terms of social development. Um, so we need to take advantage of the opportunities that our cities give us. So we see the Seven Festival as a platform from which we'll be able to confront the challenges, but also uh, take advantage of the opportunities that cities provide. But in many ways, we're also saying that it is not a government agenda. Cities are not just about government and governance, but they are also about uh, a community. They are also about business. They are also about a whole range of stakeholders, academic institutions, cultural institutions, non-governmental organizations. So as we find solutions to our cities, these solutions need to involve everybody in what generally would call a territorial governance model where all stakeholders are involved in the way in which our cities evolve and develop. And in many ways, we're seeing this month as an opportunity where all stakeholders would contribute their ideas, their initiatives um, to the growth of our cities and to um, the ability of, um, of government and all of society to respond to whatever challenges and issues that our cities need to deal with. But this month is also an important month taking into account that South Africa celebrates in October Transport Month and enables us to deal with the important issues around mobility and urban mobility is particularly important. Uh, and the way in which we evolve our public transport system and mass transit systems is a very important issue that we need to, to continuously deal with. So, we need to take this opportunity to engage with that reality. We're also in the midst of UN Habitat's 40 Day Safer Cities Challenge that confronts cities and citizens to look at creating safer cities in our environment. Um, and um, the discussion and conversation around cities at this stage is not just limited to ourselves. It is an international conversation about the role that cities would play. So it is also an opportunity to get a whole range of role players contributing to the solutions that we provide from a safety point of view, environmental point of view, economic and sustainability point of view. We need integrated approaches to dealing with the issues in our cities. Once again, thank you very much, Oliver, and looking forward to what looks to be, uh, promises to be an exciting month. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your address, uh, Deputy Minister. Uh, we're going to take a round of questions, and I'm, I'm going to shoot the first question at you um, as, uh, as to open up this round of questions. Um, in 2016, when we conceptualized the Integrated Urban Development Framework as, as an extension and as part of the National Development Plan, um, we, we sort of, uh, you know, we created these ideas and policies and goals, and we set these goals, in a space where we uh, imagined a normal time, an ideal time, so to speak. If 2020 taught us anything is that policy making should also take into consideration global disasters and pandemics that could really turn the uh, entire continent uh, on its head. 
how have you thought about how we how we configure policies and how we imagine cities, how we imagine the goals we attach to uh, our IUDF as far as uh, the future of our cities are concerned in the space where you have to take into consideration what COVID-19 has done uh, to the world, to our communities and to our cities in particular. Have you, have you spent some time thinking about that? Well, certainly I think it's an important question that you're presenting because I think uh, 2020 has been a particularly challenging year for all of us when, and, and for the global community. Uh, it, it has put to the fore uh, the need for countries to develop and adopt in line with the Sendai framework uh, on disaster risk reduction, uh, disaster management policies. As a department, we are also responsible for the implementation of the disaster management framework of the country. And one of the issues that we're confronting is to revise um, our disaster management framework to take into account the important uh, reality that we're confronting that in fact, uh, we are likely over the next few decades to, co to confront different levels of disasters. We can experience, for example, two disasters that were declared in our country this year. Uh, COVID-19 is one of those uh, disasters that have been declared, but also preceding that was the declaration of, uh, of uh, the national drought disaster. Uh, as an issue. So we're likely to confront more and more challenges with regards to disasters, especially as uh, weather patterns change in our country and globally. And our policies now need to place disaster management as central to the way in which we govern our cities and our country. Thank you. I have a question here from uh, Rihanna Musaji. I hope I said that uh, correctly, Rihanna. If I did butcher your, your surname, please do forgive me. Minister, she makes a very uh, important point here. Uh, Rihanna points to the fact that uh, COVID-19 has not um, gotten us to reimagine the use of our space for mobility. You mentioned two national disasters uh, that were declared this year alone. Uh, but quite early on in this year, there was also a provincial uh, uh, state of disaster that was declared in KZN um, uh, following floods that took place there. I would imagine that mobility uh, plays a very important role in terms of how uh, we, we think about uh, disasters, how we think about our spaces and the role that cities, municipalities, civic organizations and institutions as, as, as well as communities play in terms of that. Uh, have, have, do you think that there's a deliberate effort not just to listen to people uh, that have a lot to say about mobility, but also to just integrate them and include people that do work, that think about it and are impacted by limited mobility um, um, in, in our cities? Sorry about that, I realized I, I, I did not unmute. Uh, just to say in response to the question by Rihanna that we should look at this month and this urban festival as the opportunity in fact to look at uh, reimagining our cities in response to uh, mobility, in, in response to um, uh, the dreaded disease COVID. And uh, so in many ways, I think that whilst uh, she's reflecting on the fact that we have not taken that opportunity. I think we should look at it slightly differently and say, let's use this urban festival as that opportunity to engage in these discussions and conversations and to evolve uh, our urban policy in response to the challenges that COVID-19 has pretty much brought to the, to the fore in our country and indeed globally. Uh, um, I've got an, a question here from Roland Postma, who says that urban sprawl is out of control. Everything is built around cars and architecture of fear. Can the deputy minister recognize that we are failing uh, the fight to build more inclusive, compact, and people-designed cities and towns? Minister, deputy minister? I, I fully agree with Roland. I think that uh, as a country, we will... We, we'll, uh, continue to confront the challenges in our urban system uh, in response to the way in which our cities are evolving and built. So we haven't done much to ens ensure that we're able to create greater integration and uh, greater efficiency in our urban system. Um, and the integrated urban development framework is designed to exactly do that. So the conversations we're having here are exactly about that. 
But it's just, it's not just about the policy because the policy is there. It's not about implementation. It's about confronting the policies and, and budgetary instruments that we have in place and the integration thereof in such a way that they are able to achieve uh, greater integration and urban efficiencies in our cities. So the reality Deputy the transport the subsidy models, we need to, look, to really look at our spatial frameworks. Many cities talk about creating compact cities, but the reality is that we have not created the compact cities that we're talking about. So we need to change that. Um, and, and different cities, I know that uh, in Johannesburg, we had adopted the Corridors of Freedom as an initiative to uh, address the spatial challenges and the spatial disintegration of our cities. And I'm talking disintegration to the extent that, in fact, our cities disintegrated the reality that uh, they are not efficient. They are unable to create the levels of, um, of um, efficiencies that an urban system needs, not just to prosper that urban system, but the country as a whole. So yes, different cities have adopted different policies. Some initiatives have been undertaken in different cities, but we need to accelerate those. And that's what the challenge is right now. Uh, Deputy Minister, I, I want to ask a follow-up question on what you just addressed. I don't know if you remember, but in 2018, when President Ramaphosa had delivered his first State of the Nation address, um, he, he had, he had a, a segment in his speech that got the country uh, quite uh, divided, riled up, and some very excited, and some not so excited. When he spoke about, he, he had this dream of a future city where uh, bullet trains would be uh, the order of the day as far as transportation is concerned, getting people from work and to their places of residence, uh, and, and a city where um, every household has access to fiber uh, and data costs are a thing of the past and everyone can afford it, uh, where education is proliferated in such a way that not only us, but that not, not just schools being hubs of education, but the entire environment being an education and information hub. I don't know if you remember that, uh, Deputy Minister, because your answer sounds a lot to that effect, uh, which I think is a brilliant thing. But do you think that we have the policy, financial, uh, and political muscle uh, to make that a reality? We certainly do. I certainly think that there is a political will, one of the, and, and uh, the intention to rebuild our cities in a manner that is great, that is more efficient and a manner that is, is uh, sustainable. Uh, I'm looking at different national policies that seek to respond to that. We're also looking at provincial policies. So you have, for example, Houting adopting the global city region approach um, that says, well, we need to look at the morphology of the entire Houting uh, as an integrated uh, system. So how do we ensure that we're able to leverage of that? You're also looking at different city policies that are there. And it's now about integrating all those initi initiatives under one roof. And that is exactly what the integrated urban development framework is. As you would know, the president also launched the district development model, uh, which is our model of creating over overall integration of all of government policy, planning, uh, budgeting, and implementation systems uh, so that uh, you're able to gain great attraction, but also uh, uh, achieve um, uh, greater levels of um, cooperation between the different spheres of government. But we should not just limit it to government. You should remember that in reality, the system is private respond to that we create, they are able to create the efficiencies that we seek to create. Uh, it is also about uh, research institutions. It is also about the way in which we deliver the services that we deliver, the way in which we provide water, electricity, and the sustainability thereof in our cities is crucial uh, in this regard. So yeah, I agree with you 100%, thanks. You, 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 you are in a new, unique position where you've been a mayor of the biggest city in the country, um, uh, you know, Johannesburg being, being a world-class African city, and you're now sitting at the level of national policy making and regulation. Um, do you think that cooperation that you speak of does exist, given that in South Africa, uh, about five of the six major uh, uh, metros and cities in the country uh, have found themselves in some sort of political deadlock 
uh, whether it be because a coalition uh, agreement fell apart or whether it be irregularities in the appointment of certain people, do you think that the stability for that does exist? Well, I think firstly, we should acknowledge ourselves as a unitary country. And when you're looking at the unitary system of governance in a country, you need to develop systems that ensure that we function as a unitary country. Uh, as a country, we adopted um, uh, legislation uh, to ensure that we're able to achieve that level of integration of different levels of government. So when you look at the Intergovernmental Relations Framework Act, which is the legislation that governs uh, levels of, inter of cooperation uh, and intergovernmental relations. We've created systems such as the President's Coordinating Council, where the President sits with all the nine premiers in the country, uh, where you also have the South African Local Government Association represented by its presidency. So it's a mechanism of ensuring that we're able to coordinate at the national level. You have the Presidential Infrastructure Coordinating Committee that looks at the infrastructure issues where all the metropolitan mayors are also, part, metropolitan municipal mayors are also participants. So you have those levels of cooperation. Now what we're talking about is how do we take that level of cooperation to the municipal level? How do you, do you take it to uh, the geographic spaces that uh, our districts and metropolitan municipalities are organized around? The president has assigned ministers and deputy ministers as champions of the district development model in all the 52 districts in our country. So you literally have uh, ministers and deputy ministers responsible for, let's say you have a minister responsible for the city of Johannesburg. And the responsibility of that minister is to bring all of government together to work with the city of Johannesburg in as much as the province is dedicating similar resources uh, to deploy uh, MECs in the different uh, uh, districts. So you are literally having a situation where such deployment enables uh, that level of cooperation now, not just at the national level, but now taking it to the district level. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the district development model. The act also empowers the Minister of COPTA to issue regulations that govern intergovernmental relations. And we will be issuing regulations to implement the district development model and therefore decentralizing the level of integration. Because we, one country, we have a common destiny and we need to work together regardless of political affiliation. We need to build this country and create prosperity for all and redress um, our imbalances and uh, the historic subjugation uh, that we've confronted as a country. Thank you. I've got a question here from Palisa in the city of Ekuruleni. Uh, Palisa asks, uh, makes the statement that the pandemic has not made us reimagine prioritization. Safety of citizens ought to lead and the pandemic ought to make us relook designs and densities of settlements. Will this also change theories of migration and urbanization as we know it today? In fact, in response to Palisa, I should say, I think that uh, we're likely to see uh, increased levels of urbanization as people uh, go out in search of opportunities. The pandemic has created um, increased levels of unemployment, increased levels of poverty, and people will be going to cities to look for those opportunities. Uh, so our cities are likely to be uh, overwhelmed, I think, unless we all are able to plan and implement together. So let us take this opportunity to do exactly that. Let us work with the cities, let us work with all of government, let us work with all stakeholders to ensure that we're able to respond to the challenges. In many ways, um, you know, it is always argued that uh, urbanization uh, in essence is an opportunity to create prosperity. And uh, the reality is we have not completely leveraged uh, the levels of urbanization in our country. And I think that we should ensure that we're able to leverage that and ensure that as people come into cities, not only do they create prosperity for themselves, but they are able to create the prosperity of the, city, of the cities in which they locate and therefore the prosperity of the country. Thanks. Yeah. 
Minister, I have a question here from uh, Gechi Karuri Sabina, who says, as we talk about empowering the civic this month, Deputy Minister, what do you think we need to change about the ways local government and national government tend to engage with regular people uh, like us so that we can all have space and support to innovate and advance our efforts, whether as entrepreneurs or as NPOs and activists, to just get things working in our communities. Um, I can think of many examples uh, where that question uh, goes into play, whether it be getting just street lights to work, whether it be getting just uh, refuse to be removed at an adequate time, uh, potholes to be fixed, uh, whether it be getting, uh, uh, you know, traffic regulations for minibus taxis to be adhered to. What can we do in terms of how that engagement currently happens? Because um, I, I, I personally feel, and, and many people may differ on this, that the communication seems to be a one-way stream at the moment. Well, certainly we need to create communication that is not one-way stream. Um, and attempts have been made to ensure that we're able to, to create greater participation by stakeholders, but they've not always been successful. I mean, municipalities are required by law to create ward committees. So in every uh, ward, municipal ward, uh, you're supposed to have different stakeholders participating in the governance of, um, of uh, their particular jurisdiction. Uh, legislation actually provides that uh, certain municipal functions could even be delegated to those wards. Uh, but the reality is that our ward uh, committee system has not reached the optimal levels that, that it was designed to achieve. And I think that we need to ensure that we continue to build on this. But I see citizen participation and, and the reality that uh, COVID-19 has presented to us is that we converse, conversing on a platform such as this and therefore create opportunities to converse all the time through um, uh, virtual platforms and uh, through technology systems. And I think we should uh, take some advantage of those opportunities uh, that, that uh, are necessarily created by this. Um, and the last point I want to make is that I think that we need to, to consider accel accelerating policies such as mutual co-production initiatives. You know, one of the initiatives we undertook in the city of Johannesburg, and for us, it was about creating real partnerships with communities, was uh, the Jose at Work initiative. And Jose at Work was essentially designed such that communities become partners in the delivery of municipal services. And, um, we had created 7,000 participants at that point and more than 1,000 enterprises that were participating in the, in the delivery of municipal services. And in that way, we were able to ensure greater citizen ownership of the services that are delivered so that you don't see the municipality as a delivery truck whose duty it is to literally ferry goods to citizens, but see citizens as partners in the delivery of municipal services. So I think that we have learned lessons. I think that there were lessons similarly in a city such as uh, Tswane, uh, where there were different initiatives, including Kukamau and other initiatives that ensured that citizens are partners in the delivery of services and therefore in the destiny of our cities. Deputy Minister, thank you so much for your time. We really, really do appreciate it. We're going to leave it there. Um, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we all really do appreciate it and all of the best. Thank you very much. Uh, looking forward to uh, this whole month, really, and the different uh, platforms that we've been engaged in. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Minister Park Stau. Uh, there are quite a lot of questions uh, on the uh, chat box right now that we weren't able to ask and bring forward to the Deputy Minister, really important questions. Um, I would encourage you to, to, to uh, tweet some of those questions and don't forget that the hashtag is hashtag UrbanFest2020, or you can simply tweet us at SA Cities Network on Twitter. Uh, you can use Facebook as well. Uh, and you can also, the Facebook page is Urban uh, Festival 2020. Or you can also tag us on Instagram. Do go ahead and do all of that. We do encourage that you engage with some of, uh, some of the, and further some of these questions on social media uh, so that we can get the conversation uh, rippling throughout the country to enrich and 
some of the ideas um, and solutions that we will have to some of the problems uh, that we identify uh, that, that we posed as questions to the Deputy Minister. Uh, but do continue that engagement. Up next, uh, we will be uh, having a conversation between uh, Rashik Fatah, who is a urban practitioner and the founder of Our Future Cities. Our Future Cities is recognized as the leading platform for cities in South Africa and Africa and has a reach of over 120,000 people. That is incredibly uh, uh, impressive. Uh, Rashik will be joined by Sumeya Vali, who is the director of Johannesburg-based architecture firm Counterspace. Uh, Counterspace uh, was nominated as the youngest team uh, to be involved with the Serpentine Pavilion in London. That is incredibly, incredibly uh, uh, impressive and Sumeya and the team at Counter Space are, you know, they're inspired by their location, Johannesburg, and they're involved in a myriad of other initiatives uh, that involve their creative work um, and, and, and get, them, get them thinking about design um, and, and get them thinking about sustainability. Um, and I think we could benefit a lot from their intellectual labor. Uh, Rashik, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Sumeya, thank you so much for joining us. Really excited to have you guys here. Thanks so much, Oliver. Thanks, Samaya. Uh, Oliver, I just wanted to perhaps galvanize and energize us with the, the poetry which we've organized today. Um, so if, if you could hand uh, the mic back to, to our live spoken word poet, uh, Emma, uh, that'll give Samaya and I the energy we need to, to, and the inspiration for our conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that. We do have a poem by Emma. Um, Emma is, uh, has joined us on the live stream right now. Emma, good morning and welcome to the live broadcast. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Emma, your poem um, is, serves as the soundtrack, so to speak, of this month uh, of, of the tone. Uh, that we that we want to that we want to embody this month. Before you recite your poem, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself as a, as a poet and what inspired this particular poem that you're about to recite for us? And when did you write it? So I am a performance poet, and um, sure, writing for me is an absolute passion and joy. So the poem which I am going to render j just now was uh, written last year for the Fako Gesi Digital um, Innovation Festival, which is done for Africa. And they were just, they had a beautiful image of um, a woman in power and just speaking about the force which we have as Africans. And the beauty about that is uh, the ability to speak creatively to the fourth industrial revolution. And uh, because we are really in the new age altogether. And so um, the Urban Festival coordination team, thank you so much for the opportunity, decided, you know what, given the power of that, the force of that piece, um, let's actually open up the Urban Festival with this piece for the coming week. And there are more exciting things coming for the rest of the month. Emma Mavia, thank you so much. Uh, own Your Own Force, that's the name of the poem. Go right ahead. It's inevitable to be third world when your name has been extracted from your tongue and its gravitas unearthed from your mind. With fragments in our hands, attempted recreating beauties lost to the sleeping moon, Africa. You are the essence of innovation and origin of civilization. How have you forgotten the root of all life? The first human words were spoken by you. You cradled mathematics, rocked navigation, pressed paper from papyrus reed, burped pyramids, were visionaries before we were accredited, so we exhaled the future. Exponential innovation and thinking for you was not a program incubated in a hub. It was your communal daily bread, imagination, the language with which we spoke to each other. Fear irrelevance brewed by old knowledge. Fall in love with the future you have not kissed. Set your own table before the world. Deck it with your own systems. Feast on your force to drape descendants with a power. Not all that is foreign is greater than your own. Hone your force. Own your ish. Thank you. 
What a beautiful poem. What a beautiful poem. Um, the unfortunate part about a virtual gathering is that we can't hear <laughs> the almost 70 people in the room uh, give you a round of applause, but you certainly do deserve it. Well done, Emma. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Of what she had said, uh, that poem will be repeated throughout the month. And in our next session, uh, my I, IUDF uh, one, which is a which is one of four conversations about the IUDF that we'll be having throughout the month. That poem will be repeated. Uh, so do stick around if you'd like to hear that again. Rashik, you standing by with Sumeya, uh, take it away. Thanks, Oliver. Hello, my friend. It's so nice to <laughs> to see you, if not in person. It's it's been a long time, and the pandemic has made it uh, difficult to connect in the ways uh, we've spoken about it, about our work pressures and the demands. And but I'm really happy that that we are we are here. And and just from myself and my team, we we're so proud of you. And uh, just in all the ways that your work has has gone from uh, from you know South Africa to uh, in particular your laboratory called Johannesburg to the rest of the world. So just to say welcome and and we're so proud and happy to have you here today. Thank you so much um, to yourself and your team for inviting me and for having me. Um, I always feel at home with your team especially um, and I think if I think back to some of the earliest counter space projects so many of them happened in conversation with yourself and your team. So I'm really privileged to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Amir. Um, so this urban festival is really, well, I find it to be quite fun. Um, I was speaking to Pete Ahmed yesterday on a podcast and he, he said to me, well, he calls me Rashi for some reason, but he said to me, uh, I can't believe there are 72 free events and you can click on of course, there are so many barriers to people accessing virtual events. Um, our world remains quite broken between this family, home, remote working life, and then we go back into the physical world. Uh, what has it been like in the kind of work and research you do to find the, the ways to still inspire your clients and partners, but you're disconnected? I know you work, you work, you speaking to people in Germany and the US and and in many ways, it's better for you. But how's it how's it been to to still galvanize your your various projects and partners? I must say, for me, it's been quite a challenge. Um, I like as was mentioned um, in the introduction, and as you know, I think that my work and my practice is so connected to Johannesburg. And I've been actually a little bit disappointed in how reliant I am on the external energy um, and of being in the city. And so much of my inspiration is from absorbing place. Um, so I found especially the beginning of lockdown really, really challenging um, because of that. Because, you know, I think I just find being in the city and also reflecting on all the, of the things that Emma said um, in, in, in that beautiful and moving poem. Um, there is so much to be learned from being in Johannesburg and it, I think it really feeds me and my practice. So I found this moment to be really difficult. Um, having said that, I think that I also have had access to be in conversations um, that I wouldn't have ordinarily, you know, have had access to. So I've been able to attend events and listen to speakers and so on. Um, you know, almost every day in a different country, which is really wonderful. But I also don't want to um, romanticize that too much because we do know that uh, that is also a, a deep level of privilege and that for most people, um, the digital realm is also a barrier. Not, it's, it's not really about access. Yeah, and in our, in our conversation um, last week, I said to you, I wanted to start by reflecting perhaps on the past and then move into what you're working on now and then speak about the future and, and futuristic ways of empowering the civic. But when I look back on, on reflect on even some of our projects, especially the ones where we failed uh, to achieve the outcome, despite the process being good, uh, you know, civic empowerment is really more than community engagement and a tick box of public participation. 
just thinking, you know, have, have we perhaps failed in the past? Um, if you reflect on some of your experiences and work and as an actor in the city and in cities, uh, isn't it just a bit dull and boring as the past? And I think back to some of your early exhibitions, the sort of Archie Mart where you could shop around for architecture or I'm imagining that's, that's a way that somebody walking to public transport in the evening could pop into something or, you know, somebody who's working three jobs and using public transport two hours in each direction doesn't quite want to walk to a town hall meeting in Manenberg at night to, to comment on a, a spatial development framework or a district plan. I mean, have we failed in the past? Have we been a bit boring and uninspired, even younger people like ourselves? Um, yes, I think, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a big uh, question. I think we definitely have failed in the past. I think we are still failing to a great degree. But I think that for me, a lot of it has to do with where we are looking and also reflecting again on Emma's poem. I think um, if we look and listen deeply to our own spaces and places, um, there is so much to be learned and gained from there. And I think in terms of thinking about how we have um, empowered the city or empowered the civic in our really deep past, if we think back to our own traditions, into our own, um, you know, uh, beliefs, cultures and systems, we didn't have distinctions like or private and public. We, in, in, in our own languages, the terms that we use are much more fluid. They might be about intimacy and about gathering, um, which I think allows for a different understanding of what it means to be in a city. Um, and I'm not I'm not saying that uh, you know we should not we should be only navel gazing. I think of course it's it's great to look at examples from the north and the west or whichever way we orientate ourselves. But I also really, really deeply believe that there is so much to be learned um, in looking deeply at our own context. And um, if I think back to when Counterspace was first formed, um, you know, when we were still students, it was very much developed out of a frustration that we felt with the profession and with the canon that we are not looking deeply at, in my case, Johannesburg, but at the knowledges that are embedded and exist in our city and how we can kind of use those and galvanize those and imagine different kinds of architecture. So I just wanted to clarify, you uh, touched on words like intimacy and gathering. Mm. Um, has, I think, I think I'm wondering, you know, the sort of legal process of what we consider to be civic engagement and empowerment and the legal requirements. Mm. What, what does that mean for the layperson? How do we, how would that have, have evolved um, beyond simply gathering communities in town halls? Is it in the kinds of spaces? Is it in, I mean, language is a big barrier. I know someone once said to me, in certain languages, architecture is not a word or an architect. And so, yeah, for the layperson, how, how do we give expression to this uh, uh, intimacy and, and gathering um, and, and maybe make it a bit practical? Yeah, I think, you know, we often say that our, um, our architectures are inherited from elsewhere. Um, and that's completely true. But I think that um, in reconfiguring architectures, we also need to be thinking about how we reconfigure program and how we reconfigure platforms that people engage on. Because those same platforms, even you mentioned the word town hall, uh, you know, it's we, we also need to be reflective and think about how those forms of like where those forms of gatherings originated, who they speak to, what are our own forms of gathering and how can we, I don't know, kind of, you know, learn from uh, both platforms or, or different kinds of platforms. Um, I'm just trying to think of an example. Just give me a moment to look for something on my computer. There's no rush at all. Okay. Um, So in, 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 in this project that I'm sharing now, um, can you see the screen? Yes, perfectly, thanks. 
Okay, um, so this was a um, public engagement project that we did in Plierhof, which is next to Soweto in Johannesburg. Um, and in, in this form of engagement, uh, I really wanted to think about like beyond just having, um, you know, our traditional workshops and so on, which are also very important and which we included, we really tried to think about how we can um, not invite, just invite the community in, but actively go out and start to be in communities and work on embedding ourselves deeply in, in those communities. As Deputy Minister mentioned, how do we start to um, embed ourselves and how do we start to form real meaningful partnerships with communities? So I think that, as I was saying, I think that designing, a, designing platforms for engagement is really important. And sometimes it's about, you know, I think even, sorry, I'm going all over the place, but thinking as an architect, it's not just about thinking of, um, designing structures and designing build things. It's also about thinking about how we design forms of engagement. So in, in this project in particular, um, we inserted ourselves into um, a lot of the market days that were held in the community. So this is an example of one of the maps where we asked people to map um, their aspirations and so on. We also asked, you know, I think it's really about also designing research questions. How do we start to get people to articulate things? So we asked people things like, um, where do you feel unsafe? And, um, you know, where do you, uh, which route do you walk at night? Because I think that there is so much learned and embodied knowledge in how people are using their cities that we need to start to draw on and draw from. Um, and we set up um, an oral history booth in the community um, on, on one of the market days. It was, we, we had no budget, of course. So it was just a simple okay. yellow background and a video camera with folding chairs, but it became really, really iconic and people started talking about it. Um, lots of kids brought their grandmothers and you know, I think that is something, oral tradition and history is something that we can, that is in us and that we need to be drawing on and drawing from. How do we really, really start to bring out, um, you know, those forms of knowledge? Um, we, also, we also designed an interactive, um, Fence. So, I mean, I am also really interested in this idea of how we can make walls more porous. And this, this is a fence that's at the local community park. And um, what we did here is we set up a little uh, play area for children, again, super inexpensive. And we set up community billboards where we ask people questions periodically. We also put up some of the visions that the city was imagining and um, asked people to comment on it. And these were set up strategically in locations um, next to informal traders at taxi stops and so on, so that, you know, they really started to become a part of the city. We also really worked on making them um, uh, areas that ch children could play in or, um, uh, you know, for example, something that could function as a bus stop um, or shelter or an outpost for a trader and so on. I think as with any of these projects, um, you know, budget is always a constraint and something we have to be mindful of. But I think the ambition of trying to reconfigure the platform for engagement is very much there. Um, and, you know, I, I think also thinking about forums for discussion, like how, how do we draw on share things simple forms of gathering like how people share a meal together um cooking together in communities how do we start drawing on those and bringing them into our forms of practice so that this so that our work can also um yeah look in different places and ask different questions yeah that's really inspiring and and i i, I laughed a bit because i can relate so much uh, when you say things like the the attempts at creative or innovative engagement often have no budget mm. uh, or limited budget because unless you're publishing on the radio or listing ads in a newspaper, um, nobody's really going to incentivize uh, another layer of, of, of engagement. And, and there's still a, I suppose there's also a culture of, of fear around what it means to empower the civic or empower that relationship because how do you manage expectations and promises how do you um you know it's, it's one thing to give power to the people what if people really are in power and i think in many during the pandemic we've seen the 
the inability of local municipalities to 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 deal with with land issues and housing issues um, to uh, suddenly we've seen these community networks pop up around cities where it's these community networks be it faith-based groups or uh, community groups or or these these networks between different neighborhoods which have told us about where there is hunger simple questions and where there is a need for extra safety or where somebody has been removed from their home so it's not been an app and it's not been um it's not been uh, necessarily zoom calls which have done that um so what we thought was a very a, a solid but function well not functioning but at least some form of relationship i think in a pandemic that's really was stressed and stretched and and i hope in future that some of the methods you were showing and the approaches do have budget i'm just going to pop a comment which rihanna made earlier mm. which i wanted to link to our conversation last week as well and she says that we tend to over focus on infrastructure to the exclusion of development of people's internal states civic pride connection to nature community solidarity etc uh, and I'm also thinking about civic pride and civic activation. And, and uh, you mentioned to me, which I, I, I suppose I wasn't surprised, but it, it, it did touch on what we could mean by empowering the civic, the Jerusalem challenge. And what, just, what are the things capturing people's imagination? And, and how do we bring a city or city's conversation into that? Um, I suppose you've already answered the question, but uh, what about that is interesting to you? And and why are architects thinking about dancing? Mm. <laughs> um, more architects should be thinking about it, I think. Um, it's also really nice to um, hear that from Rihanna. Um, Rihanna, great that you're here and please also join in the conversation as well. Um, I think, uh, so just, just to touch on what you were saying, I think what, what captured me and captivated me about that is, um, I think in in South Africa and um, Deputy Minister also touched on it in his introduction. He, you know, and I've heard him say before uh, that our cities are unequal by design, and that we're still dealing with the legacies of apartheid and so on, which we all know. Um, but we know it kind of abstractly, and I think that uh, you know. Um, how do I say? If if we think about what that means um, in terms of how we feel, you know, we don't know who are in 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 many communities, um, uh, especially like around where I live, people are not connected to each other. There's no visibility, or otherwise, people are really connected to each other in bubbles. We don't know, you know, what the other side of Johannesburg looks like, and it's possible to live a very, very isolated life and not interact at all with, with anyone who doesn't look like you or is not in your class bracket. And I think that um, what this Jerusalem challenge did is it, it really brought about visibility. So, you know, there is like a collective solidarity happening um, across uh, ethnicity, across culture, across the country. Um, and something that is so fun really galvanized people. Whatever whatever one's opinion is about it, I think it really did. It really did something to capture people's imagination. And I think um, that there is there is always architecture to be found in the lives of people and in as I was saying earlier, in things that are embodied and things that are performed. These are our ways of making space. Um, as as Africans, um, as mm. you know, people of the South, if, if I can say that, I think I think our in in my experience, or at least what I'm trying to embody in my practice is, it's much more for me about absorbing place and absorbing um, these ways of being, and drawing them into the discipline and trying to think about how we can work with them. Um, and choreography has been hugely inspirational for for my practice. Um, these are abstract architectural drawings. So uh, just bear with me if they, if they feel unclear. But for example, even in designing um, the public engagement of an event, I think how the event is choreographed 
is really, really important. Um, and to think like, like an architect and a choreographer is, is, is really essential. How can we start to move things onto the street? How do we foster social engagement at the same time as we are fostering discussion and dialogue? Um, can we think of um, performance lectures or bringing in um, things that we don't traditionally think of in, in, into the lecture platform or into the engagement platform so that we also are inviting people in and we are um, making, making these platforms more accessible and more open. Um, yeah, and, and I think you, 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 you mentioned dance, but in particular, I think choreography is really an essential part of, of all of our projects. Um, even if I think of the Serpentine Pavilion, uh, choreography has also been essential in, in terms of thinking about the architectural structure and how it comes together from different places across London, but also in thinking about how we can think about gathering in other places um, in migrant and peripheral neighborhoods. I just wanted to touch on that, Samaya. The you spoke a bit about the uh, the pavilion, um, uh, which you are in the process of of developing. Uh, is location still that important? Uh, some people have said it's a bit irrelevant these days. I, I'm I'm sure that will change. But if you can maybe touch on the sort of idea of the pavilion, where it is about one location, but it's not. And I would love to go to Park Station or um, uh, or to the My City bus station in Cape Town or somewhere and, and have something like that, which is, which is empowering me through knowing about what's happening in the city and planning and mm -hmm. tapping a screen and chatting to an official. Uh, how, are you, well, how are you thinking about this idea that, that it's not just about um, one pavilion, one space, one, one here? And I think that applies to, as I mentioned, with public transport, people walking home in the evening. What, what are the ways you're thinking about about uh, pushing the borders of that, pushing the boundaries? Yeah, so I mean, I, when we were approached to design something, I approached it very much in the same way as I would approach something in Joburg. And for me, it was about, um, you know, I, I looked at this, this park in Hyde Park in London and I felt that it was just waiting for a gesture. And I really wanted it to be about extending um, the pavilion outward and about bringing in as many voices as possible. Um, I'm gonna, sorry, I have to look for something again. Just mind with, bear with me as I try to share screen. Um, can you see, can you tell me what you yeah. are seeing? Okay. I'm seeing a food truck and- Okay, cool. Um, so, when I when I visited London, um, actually, I really believe in being in being based in a place when one is working on a project as much as possible. I spent a lot of time um, first in the archives in London. So I, went, I started at the Bishopsgate Library and I looked at a lot of spaces in migrant and peripheral neighborhoods that um, had have been erased in history, really important spaces of cultural production. And to touch on what you're asking about the virtual, I think that virtual engagement is, um, is great. And I think that we need to have more of it. And I think it should absolutely be considered. But I also really believe in the sacredness of physical gathering. And I think it's really important um, uh, in, in, you know, for, for people and for communities, because physical space is where we exert our identity and where we construct forms of belonging and, and where we construct community. Um, so these are some of just, just some images from uh, different neighborhoods in London that I walked through um, and that inspired the pavilion. And these forms in the pavilion, um, are all based on places of gathering in migrant and peripheral neighborhoods. And the um, ambition is that some of these fragments or small pieces of the pavilion will be located in these neighborhoods and they'll be activated by events and by gatherings in these neighborhoods. Um, a lot of them are about uh, the historical erasure that I mentioned, but a lot of them are also about how communities support each other and construct belonging. And then over the course of the year, um, these little fragments will move into the park and, 
and, and the pavilion will be launched. This is still under design um, development, so I, I, I can't elaborate too much on it. But um, being in London really, really informed, um, informed the forms of the pavilion and um, also engaging with communities and understanding the deep pasts and how we can also start to reflect the lives of people in our architecture and learn from their ways of gathering was also really, really important. Sumer, there's a, um, we're very lucky to have uh, uh, on our, our team and on our steering committee, Geshe, who's, who's one of the, the more inspired and connected and real thought leaders on, on the future and smart cities. And there's a great quote and Geshe, could correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, but she wrote a piece a while ago which really resonates with me about uh, about the future. And I think when I'm thinking of empowering the civic, I'm thinking about I'm thinking about the futuristic, you know, headsets and virtual reality and augmented reality. But in one of her pieces, she said, "Well, what about our younger? What about our youth population? How are we going to energize our, one of our biggest assets and not just?" invest in tech or invest in getting people free data but how do we what what do we what do we say to young people what is the average age in these meetings and these gatherings um i think the average age in the african continent is is early 20s africa might be a median age of 23 24. um i think there's also a piece you recently wrote which i read online um how are you I mean, if you look back, you are still a young person. How, if you look back at the kinds of things that 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 should have been done to galvanize and empower the youth civic, um, isn't that the future, really? Yeah. Um, so I think the piece that you're mentioning uh, that that you read recently online, a letter to a young architect. Um, that was addressed to my my younger self as an architect. And uh, what I wrote about there was to look deeply within and to, so I, th I think I was reflecting on um, more broadly the architectural education system in the world and that it excludes and edits so many of our own histories. Um, and, and the letter is about uh, starting to look within the city. Um, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but it's about, it's about understanding phenomena in the city, about understanding atmospheres, about reading and writing in our mother tongues, about relearning our mother tongues, about um, starting to draw on other forms, to draw on, as you mentioned, dance, choreography, performance, um, to look at how the rituals of, of people and the lives of people work and how they embody and how they inhabit the city. Um, and I think that is, if, if there are young people listening out here, I would, I would love to say that that is my advice. Look and listen deeply to your own voice and work on, um, on nurturing that because your voice is really, really important. And now more than ever, we need to be building from places of diversity and from places of difference. Um, and, you know, bring bring that out and bring that forth in your work and in our work. Um, I think I was also, I was also taught that everything you can imagine has already been done. And I think that that's absolutely not true. There's so much that's waiting to happen, like Emma said in her poem, um, in our cities, it's 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 almost like everywhere we look, there's design form waiting to happen. But if I think of many of our um, engagement structures or many of our failures in the past, I think that we are we are almost ignoring them, or we are blind to what's actually happening um, in our cities. So, May, I'm going to put you on the spot and. Uh... And, and ask you to think five years, five years from now, uh, in relation to our theme, Empowering the Civic, uh, if we could leapfrog five years into the future in terms of enhancing this government people relationship, nurturing it, building trust, making it fun and interesting, um, what is one thing you think we could, we could do today, tomorrow to, to just get a jump into the, into the future? I know that you know, entire, not just government, but public sector, private sector, we've all been, we've all been 
forced to quickly become remote workers. Um, so we, in a way, we've had to leapfrog and give up the, the luxuries of, of, of movement and, and other aspects of life. Um, but yeah, what is, what is the one thing we can maybe do to, to jump forward quickly? Is that maybe just uh, free Wi-Fi everywhere and everyone can, can, can log into to virtual calls? Or is it, is it something that is not necessarily tech-based? Um, I think, I mean, tech-based things are not the first things that I think of usually, but I think that um, what you are saying is, is, is making me think more and more of um, how much more hybrid things need to be. So I think if, you know, I hope that in the near future, things will start to feel less binary. Um, we often talk about rural development and urban development, and I think that thinking about um, how, the, how things can function together, like, how, you know, what can we bring in from other things and how can we fuse that with current conditions? So I hope in the near future that our platforms for engagement will include the virtual, but they will not only be, you know, I, I hope we don't only move to being super tech because I think, um, <laughs> I will certainly really miss the energy um, of being in the city and of face-to-face um, -face engagement with people. Uh, but I think there is absolutely value in bringing in the virtual, in bringing in, um, uh, you know, in, in, in thinking about how we can use the virtual and in how um, the things that I mentioned, things like performance and things that are oral and oral, those things also work really well with things that are virtual. Um, so if we think of things like, you know, working with projection as a design medium, working with things like sound and so on, um, as part of our architectural vocabularies, we're also starting to break down really um, closed systems through that. And I think that I, I have the same hope for forms of engagement, that they'll start to feel more open and more democratic because uh, our platforms will start to become more hybrid. Yeah, I learned something that, yesterday. Right. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I learned something yesterday from, from one of my colleagues who spoke about something I never heard about before, natural language processing and and artificial intelligence and how you could start to actually build knowledge across dialects, across, you know, they, they say we have um, 11 official languages, but within those 11 official languages, there are dialects and tones and registers and, and areas with different um, uh, customs and traditions. And I think, uh, especially the jargon of, of urbanism is, is, is quite a large barrier. And I think uh, that's, that's mm -hmm. one idea I have, which is going to start to help us quite a bit in, in different parts of South African Africa. Uh, so I can't take credit for the idea, but uh, uh, it's, it's, we're learning all the time that, that we, need to, we need to find ways to reduce the barriers. Um, and I think in our program as well for this month, uh, it's, I, think it's, it's, I think for all of us, it's been the first virtual festival. Of course, we in future want to include include the physical but you know we've got some sessions by the civic tech innovation network they've got jam cafes with, with music we've got um uh, visualization studios about future cities which people could could tap into as and when they need to uh we've got some instagram live tours. so i think we've we've tried a bit to 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 merge the two tomorrow we've got for example bitprop a great um uh, start up in the in the backyard housing sector who's just going to show us around some of their work you know which we haven't been able to physically see uh, during the the periods of lockdown and the pandemic um, but I could speak to you all day I want to I want to get some questions in to to shake things up um, Oliver are there any uh, burning questions from from our, our group today yeah, we do have a couple of questions uh, on the live chat already. Uh, but before we before we do that, I just want to encourage everybody who does have questions and comments to make to get into the question uh, and chat box, uh, question and answer and chat box, uh, and drop those questions. Uh, participate in this conversation. I think uh, this is an amazing conversation. And if you do want to continue the conversation on social media, it is hashtag UrbanFest2020. Now, uh, before I go to the questions, I'm going to start off the questions, Sumaya. I'm going to throw the first question at you. Um, 
the earlier picture that you that you showed us of the uh, Serpentine Pavilion um, showed a lot of exposed cork and and, and recycled brick, um, and the the idea around recycled and sustainable material uh, being part of the inspiration of your work is really inspiring, um, and and it, it makes me think about Johannesburg. It's a vibrant city with a vibrant recycling economy, so to speak. There are a lot of waste premiers, uh, uh, you know, strolling across various parts of the city, uh, picking up various pieces of material that they, uh, you know, co uh, collect and uh, categorize and recycle. Um, do you think that architects in Johannesburg generally have a good relationship with waste premiers and, and, and recycling uh, institutions? Uh, and do you think enough of that is being incorporated into our design uh, and, and space imagination? Um, thank you for the question, Oliver. Um, I, I think that uh, it's absolutely important to think about sustainability. And I think that um, this, this festival is also so, so important in that it's focusing on on empowering the civic, because I think that sustainability is firstly about the materiality that we use, but it, we also need to think about sustainability a lot more deeply. So we have to think about um, how, you know, where things are made, how far they are traveling, the people who are making them, how things impact the lives of people, and also the social sustainability of the things we design. How do they live on? How are they owned by communities? How do we foster ownership? And how do we foster um, uh, co-production um, and co-management And in the end also? I think um, in terms of uh, what you asked about Johannesburg architects, um, I think in, uh, in, in our industry and in our profession, sustainability is, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a little bit fraught. Um, you know, I think that there are, or there is, there is a certain sector of the profession who may not be looking at um, vernaculars in all their forms. Um, you mentioned one of them, of course, we can also talk about deep vernaculars like constructing out of earth and so on. But I think, you know, even thinking about city vernaculars, um, uh, the resourcefulness that there is in how people make their lives and livelihoods in Johannesburg is also something we need to look deeply at as architects. I think um, it's sustainability in the profession is maybe guided by um, another part of the world and uh, is maybe focused on uh, green ratings and on lead systems. And I think that those are absolutely important, but I think that what you're touching on is that there are also knowledges here to be learned from and to be drawn on. And we need to be thinking about how those can also come into our work and into our structures a lot more deeply. Yeah, what a question here from Roland uh, Sumer who says, uh, love your work in advocacy. What is the one thing you want to see changed in government to ensure that planning processes are more inclusive and ensure we have better planning outcomes? Great, thank you for the question, Brolin. Um, I think uh, this is reflecting on some of the experiences I've had in um, public engagement work that we've done. Uh, if I have to say something on the spot, I think that what I would love to see is that the engagement process is made compulsory throughout the project. In a lot of the projects I've worked on, um, there is a mandatory engagement process, but it happens in the beginning of the project. And then once the structure is starting to be built and so on, that process falls away. And what I would really like to see is that um, we have inclusive and engagement processes that run in parallel throughout the design process from inception and from the brief development stage um, into the design phase, into the construction phase, into the management phase, into the maintenance phase, into the entire life um, of the project. I think that's something that we need to be investing in a lot more heavily.
do keep uh, those questions on. coming in for us. Um, you can uh, jump on into the question and answer box or the chat box uh, and drop your question or comment over there. Uh, before I throw back to you, um, uh, Rashik, there's just a few comments that I'd like to highlight. Um, some positive tones here. Uh, uh, Roland once again saying earlier on, love the rich uh, level of deliberative planning and care. Um, and this is in reference to one of the earlier slides that you have uh, showed us. The Clan Palais says, uh, nice use of spatial information in maps. Um, and Rihanna once again saying, absolutely agree, Samaya. The energetic exchanges in physical gatherings cannot be replicated in virtual formats. And I, I agree with that 100%. Rashid? I think there were some raised hands, and I just wanted to check with, with, uh, with Sean from SACN if we, if we could take any of the questions, the raised hands um, through video, just to mix things up a bit. Uh, yeah, we have a question from Emmanuel Ayisi. Uh, Emmanuel, if your hand is still raised um, uh, and you would like to go ahead with your question, um, okay. Sean? Yeah, I'll sort it out now. Just give me a sec. There's also somebody, Pamela, who's also raised their hand, so we could do that as well. Okay. Yeah, they're promoted to panelists to, so they can turn on their videos. Um, it, to Emmanuel, the if, you're, if, if you're comfortable to put your video on, otherwise uh, audio is also fine. Emmanuel, the floor is yours, go ahead. Emmanuel, are you still with us? Seems Emmanuel may not be. Uh, Pamela uh, Salasula? Pamela? Pamela also doesn't seem uh, to be with us anymore. It seems like Emmanuel's um, audio is on now. Maybe we can, maybe people have stage fright. Oh, Emmanuel's audio is on. Emmanuel, I used to go ahead. If you're having trouble with uh, unmuting yourself, you can just uh, hold down your space bar and that will automatically unmute you. Hi there, can you guys hear me? Yes, sir, yes, go ahead. Hi, hi. Oh, okay, so my question is posed uh, to Sumeya. I'm not is too this, sure is if you- Is it Emmanuel or? It's Mohammed. Yeah, that's Emmanuel. Ah, okay, you're using, okay. Great, go for it, Mohammed. Oh, um, yeah, my question is posed to Sumeya. Um, so, um, so, my interests are in affordable housing and there's this general perception that affordable housing, RDP housing, social housing is quite monotonous and boring. Where can architects and um, and uh, other sort of, uh, and these sorts of built environment practitioners come in to make, uh, make these areas more livable, more vibrant uh, places for people to live? Um, thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Beautiful question. Sumeya? Thank you. Um, Emmanuel, Mohammed, <laughs> whoever we're speaking to, thanks for the question. Um, I, again, I'm, 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 I know that I'm going to be repetitive, but I think to draw on the way that people um, uh, live their lives and to try to think more deeply about program when we think about housing, how can we um, integrate uh, other activities into housing so that we don't end up with areas where people live in really isolated environments. Um, in the in the project that I showed earlier, the Fleerhop project, that was a, a context where we were working with blocks and blocks of housing developments that didn't have enough public infrastructure. There were not enough parks or public facilities um, for people. And uh, one of the ways that we um, worked on, uh, on, on, on thinking through what else we could include in the program was to look um, 
at some at, at people's aspirations for the kinds of um, housing that they wanted to live in, uh, things that they wanted to be near and wanted to you know see in their community. And we had some really really interesting suggestions. We also drew a lot on um, historical things that were in the community that that no longer existed. People talked about things like being able to speak with their neighbors um, or to, there, there's a dragon boat race club there that um, has recently fallen into disrepair and so on. So I think um, to understand what it is that people are asking for, but also I think as architects, we need to be able to read between the lines and imagine beyond that. So we have to look at what people are asking for and then really dig deep and try to understand what kind of interactions we want to make possible and we want people to have in spaces. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I think that um, thinking about spaces where people can come together and where we can have more of civic visibility, which I think in our cities are so important, um, we, we need much more of. I've got a question from, from Gechi uh, Sumeya. Do you ever try think to define anything as African architecture or African cities or South African Johannesburg architecture uh, for that matter? Does that matter to you? Yes, absolutely. Um, Jesse, thank you for the question. I think um, that I often describe the practice as um, a practice of searching for Johannesburg or African design language and design expression. Um, it is fundamentally important to me, and I believe in it so much. I think that um, there is so much to draw on here, and there's so much that we, we can be saying from, from our context. Um, so that's, it is absolutely important. And I think that some of the things I mentioned earlier, things like performance and looking at the everyday and things that are often overlooked, um, is, is really important. Also touching on some of the things Rashik said about language and about dialect. Um, I'm really interested in how we can also uh, work with um, expressions of our identity and translate them into design form. Yeah, I've got a question here, a comment rather uh, from Luyanda Mpasha who says, um, as a practicing architect and urban practitioner, I do not believe sustainability and sensibility for green architecture is embedded enough in the teaching uh, of architecture and other built environment professions. This for me is where the problem lies. Looking only at what architects do is not enough because this will be product based, green star and dependent on clients, etc. We have to increase the sensibility towards sustainable design principles and building so that we develop a more efficient movement of professionals and academics who can drive this agenda within society. Um, I, I, I too that want to sort of pose a question to you, uh, um, Sumeya. Is there a distinctive difference between uh, a green design and recycled material being incorporated into the design and build product. Uh, so an example of this would be uh, the Constitutional Hill in Johannesburg, for instance. Um, it, it, it was a prison um, that, uh, it's the oldest prison in South Africa, in fact, um, imprisoned people since the 1890s, and in 1984 was decommissioned. Um, and when our democracy came about, the founding chief justices of the Constitutional Court thought it would be a cool idea to go and build the constitutional court in Bramfontein. And what they did was use the rock, wood, and other steel material that was used to imprison people to now be built as the, as the constitutional court. So all the exposed rock, for instance, uh, that you see inside of the court uh, come from the prison walls, uh, for instance. Is that green design or is that just simply recycling? Um, and, and what's the difference between the two? Mm. Um, I think, I don't know if I'm going to answer the question directly, but I think that on so many levels, um, that was a really powerful symbolic move uh, that took a lot of vision to um, convert the old prison into our constitutional court and the home and heart of our democracy. And that is a place that is so special in Johannesburg uh, for anyone who visits it. I think, I think 
that you know walking through that complex one really can feel uh, the energy and the spirit of so many lives that were there before um, and I think that uh, often when we think about um, building um, especially in, in our cities there is the risk of losing that special character of a place and 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 kind of killing it in, in putting down a piece of architecture. And it's really, really important that as architects, we are able to um, look at and listen to things that are happening in our city. So for example, I'm thinking of, um, like we mentioned the, the Concord complex and uh, the spirit of that place, the spirit that's embodied in that place. But I think in so many things in Johannesburg, you know, seeing um, a church gathering on a patch of grass uh, on a traffic island next to a highway um, is without romanticizing it also a really beautiful urban condition that we have and we have so many of, 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 of this kind of condition and often what happens when architecture and development happens is it squashes and tramps that life out so we need to really start to think about how we can draw on and bring those things into how we design um, and I think that for me, thinking about sustainability is a really deep question um, because it also uh, talks to really, really deep histories of the way that um, empire colonization and extraction of resources worked um, in all of our, in, you know, the world over and that things that we do still perpetuate those same logics often. Um, so like I mentioned, where something is coming from, um, the amount of transportation, the amount of labor that's involved in all of these practices. It's, it's not just about slapping on um, green materials superficially or about, um, you know, the energy efficiency of a, a window calculation or something like that, uh, which is, you know, you, you talked about green star rating earlier. I think it's about thinking through on a much deeper level um, uh, you know, how, how can what we put down contribute to a sense of place without harming or hurting it? And I think, I, I mean that in, in terms of thinking about sustainability across the board, in terms of our climatic conditions, but also in terms of the legacy that we are contributing to the city and about thinking through what we are removing from the city with everything that we put down. Yeah. I've got a question here, and, and I think yeah. you've largely already touched on it, um, but I, I do think there's some specificity to it. Uh, Johan Biku, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that correct, says, I'm interested in your perspectives on how universities should approach decolonizing architecture and planning urban design to support future planners to consider contextual challenges. Do you think that there's anything different they could do epistemically uh, in terms of how they um, manufacture the knowledge, uh, package it, and teach it. Yeah, totally. I think it is, um, as you, you are touching on, it's an epistemic and a systemic um, issue and question. And I think that far beyond aesthetics, we need to think about the ways that we learn. And, and like I mentioned, um, thinking about forms of gathering that are not about, that, that don't replicate um, power hierarchies and so on. I think the same in education. Um, so we, you know, if we think about um, knowledge systems and how those are archived and how traditional forms of research work, we also need to be thinking about how other knowledges live, where do they live, how can we access them and how can we bring them into the curriculum. Um, and I think that that's a really, really exciting uh, thing to be doing. I really believe in the project of working through curricula and um, to touch on what Geshe brought up earlier. I think that we are at the moment um, part of a movement and in a generation who is starting to, I hope, um, <laughs> starting to work through questions of identity, design identity, and how those can be expressed in design form and in architecture. And there definitely seems to be a lot more of an awareness around it. But I think that thinking about how our institutions are formed and what they perpetuate is a really, really important part of this question also. So, you know, we also need- I just put a need... on that. 
I, sorry, sorry, I just want to draw on that question of identity and and and, and bring you uh, uh, Geshe's question here that says, could you speak a bit about your being a female firm? There's an interesting little video on YouTube titled, What Would a City Designed by Women Be Like? Which argues that there is a gender difference in how we design for the city. What do you think uh, as you look at your practice and experience? Of course, culture is one part of our identity. The pres preservation thereof speaks to that context, but there's a gender disparity and a, a difference in socialization between uh, the genders uh, that also comes into play. And I think that's a really interesting question. Do you want to speak to that? Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Keshi, again um, for the question. I think, um, and uh, you also are touching on it, I think that gender is one part of our identity, culture is another, ethnicity is another, rituals and belief systems are another, and there are so many facets um, of our identity. And for me, I think all of these are lenses with which to see differently. And because we all are, all of us here are hybrid, we are conglomerates of so many different influences and things um, that allows our experience to be um, really our own and really unique. And I think that uh, being a female in this environment, um, I really have something to contribute and something to say that is different to what is perpetu being perpetuated by um, uh, what is dominant in architecture at the moment. And that comes from having a perspective of difference and from largely having been marginalized in the profession for a long time. So I really view um, all of the different facets of our identity as um, strengths and as knowledges and as bases to draw on and draw from when we design. Leading into that question, Stephanie uh, Chetty uh, poses the question, how would you empower youth and women in this space to feel safe in cities when it comes to urban design? Mm. Um, that's a, a big question again. I think also it's um, uh, an epistemic and systemic um, question that, that, that we're looking at. Um, I, I don't know if it's about empowering women to feel safe in cities. I think it's about cities. Um, I think it's about make, creating cities uh, so that they are, sorry, I don't know if I'm making any sense, but I think it's about thinking about how our cities um, are inclusive and um, how they how they allow for people to be connected and to, to be able to move safely through. And it's, it's, it's a very, um, it's a very big question that I think um, on a project by project basis, you know, this question is always there. Um, if I can maybe think of something to share quickly. Um, in, in this project, for example, this was a brief by Uber um, to create uh, a lighting installation for a safe, you know, they, they have, they had this, uh, Safer Joburg, um, or Safer Cities brief that they wanted to implement in Joburg. And what we did was we extended the brief beyond just being about street lighting into being about creating a safe walking route um, in Brownfontein and in the district. And it also, you know, we also asked questions like, do people have a safe space to sit um, with dignity, to sit and wait with dignity? Are there spaces where people can pause and reflect and feel like they can sit um, on the city sidewalk without feeling threatened? How do we start to think beyond one lighting installation and really bring that into a much, um, you know, a much more broad conversation. How can we tie into things that already exist in the city? So I think I think that thinking about it um, uh, on a much bigger scale, or so so it's uh, thinking about it across scale, I should say. So how can we think about one street light located in one corner that can completely revolutionize, revolutionize and change how people walk in the city. But then also how is that connected to, or how can that become the starting point for lots of other things to happen? Um, yeah, I, 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 I know I'm not answering the question, but I think it's a really, really big question. And the only way to um, work through it is to start. Um, where we also, in, in Counterspace, we have a 
we had a little um, shop front in Bramfontein called Backstory. And one of the salons that we ran was, called, it was around the time of the hashtag Me Too campaign, which brought women in and um, the students in Bramfontein who walk through that area often. Um, and we worked on mapping out uh, routes that women found dangerous, um, places where people had negative experiences with crime and so on in the city, particularly focused around women. Um, as a basis to draw on and draw from. And that also, I mean, it was a long time prior, but it became really influential in, in the project that I just showed um, with Uber, which wasn't implemented, unfortunately. But I think that it's about also slowly growing our bodies of knowledge and research, um, because these are really big questions, but we do have to start somewhere. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to take one last question uh, from Lebukhang Mash who had raised a hand. Um, Sean, could you perhaps bring uh, Lebo Khang Mashiko into, into the room so to enable her mic uh, to go on so that we can get uh, Lebo Khang's question? She's, she should be in right now. Lebo Khang, you're in the room. Unmute yourself and go right ahead. What's your question or comment? Lebukhan, are you with us? So Maya, while we wait for Lebukhan uh, to sort out um, uh, her muting and unmuting, uh, Jeff would like to know, what's the pavilion and, and, and why does it matter? <laughs> Um, I, don't, I don't know if I'm the right person to answer, but it is, um, in, the, in the architecture world at least, it is uh, usually, or historically, it's been, um, it's been a structure that's designed in Hyde Park in London every year, and uh, in, in the beginning of its life, um, they com the, the, the Serpentine Gallery commissioned uh, the leading architects in our field to design the pavilion. So people who are really at the top of their game and um, you know, it's, it's seen as a really prestigious award. In recent years, there's been a shift uh, to look at more emerging voices designing the pavilion. Um, and it is a real honor, I think, for, for me to be representing South Africa in a sense. Um, in the design of this pavilion. It really, really is a great honor. And thank you for representing us so well as a country. Uh, it's it really something that we all uh, should be proud of. Uh, Lebo Khang, are you, are you with us? Are you able to unmute yourself this time around and go ahead with your question? Lebo Khang Mashiro? I think people have some stage fright, but... <laughs> <laughs> that 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 might be the case uh but i i think let's wrap it there so Maya, thank you so much for your time really really do appreciate it and all of the best for the future thank you thank Great you so to much see you, Samaya. you too i'm so excited about these 72 free events also i'm going to be attending as many of them as i can um, and congratulations to you and the team also for putting this wonderful initiative together Thanks, Amir. We look, we look forward to you bringing your star power to all the events. And uh, <laughs> if, if you're there, we're guaranteed a lot of attendance. Um, but thank you so much as well for sharing your work. I know that you're, you're not somebody who always feels the need to, to just share lots and lots of work. And, uh, but I, I think the visual component was amazing for me because uh, there's some projects like the lighting project I hadn't seen before. Um, there were some questions related to constructing future cities, which you and I worked on as a project three years ago around what would women's vision cities be. So it was great to sort of move back and, and forward in time. Um, and I think, as, as Oliver mentioned, all the best for your, not just the pavilion, but, you know, all the secret projects, which I'm sure you can't talk about, and uh, the initiatives, and, and, uh, and please continue to to drop our names in circles around the world and, and to represent uh, Joburg and, and the country. Um, and I'll, I'll see you on some of, the, some of the events coming up this month. 
Definitely, I'll be there. Thank you. Thank you for having me also. Speaking of events coming up this month, uh, Urshik, do you want to uh, just give us a, a, an idea, sort of a, a brief uh, conceptualization of what to expect going forward uh, this month? Of course. I just wanted to, to put Jeff and perhaps even Geshe on the spot to just speak about, um, I think there have been a lot of people who have, and partners and calls and meetings who have brought this festival together. So perhaps Jeff, you can just take us through through some of the amazing groups and people that have, have really brought Urban Festival to life. Um, yeah, you've been there from the, from the start. Jeff, are you able to unmute yourself? Sean, could you assist? Yes, I think I'm. I think I'm unmuted. I'm uh, and I'm on the screen. <laughs> Thanks very much, Rashik. Certainly on the spot. Um, yeah, just uh, from the from the perspective of the South African Cities Network, this has actually been um, a really energizing uh, and and great approach to thinking about how we can create platforms for not just. You know, not just the usual conference goes to come together and, and be in conversation about these issues and these topics, but how we could really crowd in uh, many actors, many initiatives. Uh, and I think what's so exciting about the, the festival is, is just this notion that the, the conversation is not um, decided by a select few and that anybody can offer in content which, which really shapes the, the conversation. So. I think that's super exciting about the month. The conversations are going to, to, be, to be broad uh, and diverse uh, and led by different voices. Um, you know, uh, different actors across society are going to be leading different conversations, which, which I think is fantastic and really gives weight to, to this idea that, um, that uh, we, can, we can come together uh, and allow a diversity of voice and pull, you know, pull some of the, the points that so Mayor was sharing now that we have to lead from a point of diversity and we have to plan from a point of diversity and not, you know, not a, a single voice or a single set of voices. So certainly from the South African Cities Network's perspective, this is a, a really exciting um, exploration and experiment, if you like, uh, on how a virtual gathering uh, and, a, and a virtual platform can, can foster excitement and energy around the urban uh, deal with some of the challenges but also get really excited about the future prospects and what it means for um for for our lives and our and our society moving forward um it's it's certainly a challenging moment but we but we have so much life to look forward to in the future um and and yeah we 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 certainly hoping that this can foster a greater sense through these dialogues through these sessions through these events a greater sense that we all have a role to play um, and, and that local government is, is certainly a, a key partner, but only one partner in, in the growth and development uh, of our cities moving forward. So we've, we've tried as the South African Cities Network to offer in as many sessions as possible. Um, and we know that our partners have done the same that, that you know, make the, the program exciting. And so um, uh, Rashik is, is is, is right and I suppose putting us on the spot to say what's to come. I think there's, um, there's a really exciting program and I don't know if Geshe wants to add um, from, from the perspective of the Civic Tech Innovation Network who are the South African Cities Network's core host partners um, on, this, on, on this festival and have been kind of with us uh, through, through the journey to get here to this, to this day of launch. So um, thanks very much Rashik. I hope that covers a little bit of uh, of what you were hoping to get yeah. uh, and, and glad to be put on the spot. So thank you. <laughs> I'm just going to actually, I'm going to uh, formally mention them uh, so that we, we uh, get everybody uh, uh, a mention as well. So as Jeff from the South African Cities Network um, have, have put together a lot of uh, the events and have, uh, have championed this along with the Civic Tech Innovation Network. Uh, the Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs. We were, of course, lucky to have the 
the Deputy Minister Parks Tower with us, Open Cities Lab, who are doing really great work, not just in data, but in other areas, uh, the Vits Journalism and Media Lab, um, ICLE Africa, who've, who've also joined as a partner. And then I think you know, what you might not see, and I'll take you through some of that program, which is uh, through our open call, we've had so many different companies, organizations, and people contribute to the program, um, which have really, which has really taken it to another level. I will, I'll share my screen and take take everyone through some of the uh, some of the program and perhaps even show you how to navigate uh, in a really uh, easy fashion. Not that one. Let me just share the correct screen. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. Oh. Do that. Great. So the, of course, the, the program is quite full, but uh, we have uh, different days of the week where we're focusing on different things. Uh, for example, on Sundays, there'll be, you'll see this Sunday, if I scroll down, Sundays are our, what we're calling our film nights over here. We are screening uh, Shunted. On Saturdays, we have lots of Instagram uh, tours and, and live discussions. Uh, we have on what we're calling Fresh Fridays. So tomorrow we're getting a behind the scenes look at some of the, the backyard plots which became Bachelor Flats. Um, right after this, Jeff leads us through at 12, the five part my IEDF sessions or workshops, uh, focusing on the implementation of that very important integrated development framework. Uh, and then throughout the month, um, some really cool events, my screen not loading, um, including the, the, the four part urban jam cafes. Uh, we've got Future Cities South Africa who have got a range of conversations uh, this being transit month as well, there's a discussion on on mobility in the fourth industrial revolution. So how that will uh, will change the way we consider who provides transport, how we provide transport. Um, of course, in this month as well is, um, if I'm correct, it's World Homelessness Day. So there's a film on on facing homelessness. We are screening uh, the disappearance of Robin Hood, which is a housing project um, in in the UK. Uh, that's a film by Urban Think Tank. Uh, we're looking at children as part of the civic as well. Um, but what I'm most, I suppose, excited about, and I can't claim any responsibility for this, but the team have put together these really cool filters. So if you are more available on a certain day or date, you can see what's happening on that day. You can pop your, I suppose, any time of the day and just see what's happening. Um, if you're interested in particular topics, um, I know that I'm personally more interested in uh, issues relating to discovering cities, so places I haven't been and, and projects I haven't seen. So when I click on that, it gives me all of the events that are, are more focused on tours and exhibitions and films and discovering new places. Uh, but if you are a, a techie and you want to really just get involved in, in the tech events, I think there are a few more, but there are a number of masterclasses relating to, to tech. Um, but of course, many people during transport month are really wanting to talk about transport and there, there are a few events um, relating to mobility. And if you particularly love a certain organization, so if you, if you think that um, the Civic Tech Innovation Network are really just uh, the best, then there should be a whole bunch of events which filter through uh, based on host. If you go back to all, you'll start to see um, all of the uh, events hosted by a particular host uh, throughout the month. So yeah, we've we've tried to connect different organizations, different people. I think um, we, we're trying to encourage everyone to see the Urban Festival as fitting into their lives. All the events will be recorded. They'll be uploaded online with summaries. Uh, you can pop in and watch something a bit later. Uh, I think outside of the films and the live tours, um, most events will be will be uh, available afterwards. So we encourage people to join webinars, even if they're cooking in the evening and just watching on their phone and not contributing. We encourage people 
who are working with spreadsheets at their desk during the day to, to pop on a webinar and to have a listen. Uh, we've got some exciting guests. Um, we've got some uh, exciting firms. I know that we've got um, GovChat are hosting an event looking at ways to to get parliamentarians and government officials more connected to people. So there's really a, a full month of activity. Uh, and I'm excited because it's not just one or two days of a conference where you are forced to wear a suit and, and lanyards and USB, you get these USBs and you have generally horrible catering and uh, you've actually got a full festival where you can drink your own coffee and uh, and have your your homemade meals and, and still connect with, with amazing people from around South Africa and the world as well. Rashik, thank you so much for that. Um, and look, right after this session at 12 o'clock, we're going to have the very next session, uh, my IUDF part one, uh, reshaping our cities. Um, I'll be uh, once again facilitating that conversation. Uh, we're going to be in conversation with a fantastic uh, award-winning author, Keletzo, uh, as well as various artists who will be exhibiting some of their art uh, as a part of this conversation. I, the Zoom link has been posted in the chat box, but I will just post it once again so that everyone uh, can click on that link and it's right there in the chat box. So if you wanna be a part of that, click on that link uh, at 12, uh, 12 o'clock, uh, we're going live with that conversation. Uh, but if you're not joining us, do join us tomorrow um, uh, for the very first uh, session uh, of tomorrow and across the month, across the day, across the week. Do not forget to tweet us, um, post about us on Facebook. It is hashtag UrbanFest2020, or you can simply tag at SA Cities Network. Um, take some pictures of you having coffee and scrolling through and working on your spreadsheets while listening in on the conversations and just hashtag us. Um, there aren't any cool prizes to win, uh, but it would make the <laughs> entire festival quite fun. Um, I think to overcome uh, the impersonality of virtual conferences, uh, we sort of just have to share these really cool and, and, and homely moments that we have as we, as we participate uh, in, these, in these creative, intellectual, uh, as well as uh, leadership-based conversations about how we're going to reshape our future, our cities, um, and how we're just going to make South Africa a cooler place. I think the work that Sumeya is doing is making us a really cool place. Um, and, and nothing can be better than that. Um, you know, they spoke earlier about Master KG and Jerusalem. That really makes us a cool place. Um, and thank you so much for, uh, to Emma for the recital of her poem, making this a really cool event. Um, that was really brilliant work, Emma. Um, and that poem- Emma's got throughout some, the more, some more. Yeah, Emma's got, uh, we've, we've worked with Emma on on I think three or four more pieces. So each of the uh, urban festival events, starting from, well, this week we started with, with uh, Own Your Force. Um, and there are three more pieces. So each week we'll actually have a, all events will be playing uh, the, the new pieces. One is about youth, one is about uh, technology, one is about government. So um, there's lots more of, of the inspiring words to come. Yeah, that's certainly uh, something I'm looking forward to personally. Uh, Emma is not just a beautiful uh, writer, but she she's also recites her poems uh, so brilliantly, and it is it is entertainment that we're getting for free. Uh, so do join us at twelve o'clock. Really appreciate your time being with us today. Thank you so much to everyone who joined us for the opening session. Thanks, Oliver. Are you ending leading us out with a dance or? That's not part of the brief. <laughs> I might get to, I might I think Keshi, Keshi might be ready. Keshi, are you? Uh, is that to do my Jerusalem dance? <laughs> uh, any dance uh, or song, <laughs> I think. Uh, the rumors that you sing. Uh, uh, let's let's, let's leave them at the rumors. How about we put you on the spot and you can lead us out with the dance? <laughs> No, this, we, we don't want to start the festival. Such a bad <laughs> <night after. laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Uh, see you later. See you soon. See Thanks, you later. everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much, Sean and SSEN and Emma. That was really streamlined and, and efficient. Thanks so much. You're welcome.
Thank you. Thanks. See you later. Bye. Thank you. Bye.